Today is the second day that we're in the series at, uh, Into the Light, Light Goes Into the Darkness, a series that we're preaching on the Gospel of John. Uh, I love the Gospel of John. I've grown to, to have greatly admiration for it. I've learned so much because it's really a more mature kind of theological thinking that took place when uh, we already had the other three Gospels. Uh, but the church later, about the 100 A.D. or so, no one's quite sure, it's the last gospel written. And it's a very rich theology told in uh, story form. And we're looking at this whole theme, the light shines into the darkness. Uh, and last week we talked about the light of Christ being filled with both truth and grace. And we're going to see that played out in the life of a man named Nicodemus today as a uh, we turn to our scripture. I would like to invite you to pray with me. Most loving and gracious God, open our hearts and minds that we may be brought by the wind of your spirit into the light of truth and grace. Amen. Well, I don't know about you. I suspect this is true for all of us. But I don't like being left in the dark. I do not like being confused and unable to understand something. I like to feel confident and competent rather than foolish and slow of mind. And for that reason, I generally like to stay out of things that I don't know much about, especially if I think there's a chance it's going to make me look foolish. Speaking a foreign language terrifies me. The idea that I've got to learn a language and I will get it all wrong time and time again and forget things in front of other people who will be patiently or maybe not so patiently listening to what I've got to say. So I generally stay with things I'm pretty good at. And I suspect most of us are like that. However, there are times where life pulls us into things we have no choice but to get involved in something maybe we don't know so much about. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I made the brave decision to dump Comcast. And I made the decision to dump Comcast because AT&T had new fiber network that had been put in the neighborhood, and I knew it was going to be an improvement. And sure enough, I've been very pleased. Great upload and download speed. No problems. Not, not missing out on Zoom or fading out on Zoom since I've had this. So it's been quite a good move on my part. I knew I was going to be hooked when I talked to the person on the phone. They were very friendly, very cordial. cordial. They told me about the plan. I, I knew I was going to save at least one year uh, by buying into it. And I also very much liked the idea that no one was going to send me a lot of equipment that I had to go and then set up. No, they send out a service person a very friendly service person who did it in a short amount of time and had it all done. And no sooner had they left than I realized, oh, I've somehow got to get this new password into my printer. Well, you would think that's a simple thing to do. Isn't it hard on the computer or the phone? But not for this printer. It's a newer printer, an HP printer. It doesn't have a window on it. Which means, oh, you're supposed to have the ease of going into your computer and redoing the settings there and downloading an app. Which sounds like it's going to be pretty easy for someone to do. But it wasn't. I pulled out the instructions. Plan A. Filled with an acronyms that I know nothing about. I don't know what WAP button means. In fact, I couldn't find a WAP button. But there's a plan B. So I go to plan B. I go to plan B about three times. Plan B does not work either. Then I go to plan C. You know what plan C is? I give up. I give up. In fact, I give up because my kids are around. I don't want to say things I'll regret saying. So about two weeks later, I say, well, I got to get this figured out. So I go looking for the number. I'm going to call a real person. You know how hard it is to find a real person? Or find the number to call the real person? It's very difficult. It takes me a long time, and finally, I locate on the web, not in the instructions, how to contact a real person. I get someone right on the phone very quickly. That person, like the others, was very friendly. And he says, you know, I can tell this has been very frustrating for you. Why don't you let me help you out? Let me, give me permission. I'll take charge of your computer and do the setup for you. 
which is what he did, and it still took him 30 minutes. But I like that idea of not having to let on to somebody else that I don't know what's happening, that I'm completely in the dark here because I want to feel competent. And if you can understand this experience I had, and you've had the same experience, that's a good thing for the reading today because then you can have empathy for Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a good man. He is a very, very bright rabbi. Not only is he a rabbi, he is also one of the leaders of a nation. So he's among the top of the top. He's a rabbi's rabbi. This is a guy who knows his stuff. And he goes, we're told, in the middle of the night. The word night is used. The word night, uh, so many times in John's gospel, there's two meanings to the same word. Well, there's night that's like, well, it's nighttime. He's going to see Jesus in the nighttime. But it also hints at what else the meaning of night is. He's in the dark. He doesn't understand something. Here is a man who's looking for something more than he has, and he senses some things in Jesus, so he wants to put one leg into the light of Christ while he keeps one leg, one foot back down in the, the darkness. And he goes to Jesus hoping for answers that he can understand, that he can add to his theology and complete the theological picture that he has of what faith is and God is like and the way he's supposed to live. But Jesus, the light of Christ, the light of God, has a different message. You will hear him in the reading uh, as um, how he read so beautifully, that re reading that there was such truth being spoken. Jesus speaks the truth. The light speaks the truth to Nicodemus. But we're going to find there's also grace. But at first, before all of that, there's a great confusion. Did you notice some of those strange ways Jesus tried to explain things to Nicodemus? Can you imagine being Nicodemus as he heard it? I must be born again? Do you mean I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? How is that possible? What do you mean here, Jesus? You can't enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit, Jesus says. Born of what? Water? Spirit? Could you make it more confusing? The wind blows where it will, but you don't know where it goes or where it's coming from. Well, I don't know where you're coming from, Jesus. No one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who comes down from heaven. Jesus, why are you making this so difficult? I don't know what you're talking about. The whole conversation has been so uh, confusing. It must have been humiliating for someone like Nicodemus, a man that's so smart, has so much to offer. Why doesn't Jesus just make it easy? He leaves more in the dark than he was before he came. Honestly, when I read the scripture, I feel a great deal of sympathy for Nicodemus because I've been there. I've been in the middle of trying to figure something out. I don't ask my kids about their mathematics, by the way. I am not going there. I don't want them to know how dumb I am when it comes to math because they're a lot smarter than I am. So there are times after I struggled with this this week, I struggled quite some time with myself. I felt like I was in the dark with these scriptures again. And then it occurred to me, something occurred to me about how maybe I can make sense out of this. There are times in my life when I uh, have uh, been lost and confused, and sometimes those times in my life when I didn't have things figured out, I didn't, I couldn't, I, I was in the dark about something, and I was struggling, had a lot of questions, proving to be some of the most fruitful times of my life. I remember when I worked as a psychotherapist and worked with many people, some for quite some long time. And the people who seem to do best in therapy, who seem to heal and gain the most depth and fulfillment in their life from being willing to be more conscious and be introspective about themselves and about others and their attitudes and their ways of looking at life, were those who came and were willing to be confused. They were willing to have questions and not expect quick answers. They were willing to be in the dark and because they were willing to be in the dark and they were willing to go deeper and deeper, they found great awareness and healing that 
really transformed their lives. And the people, they didn't last very long. And sooner or later, would just simply walk away, maybe not even let you know they're not coming back with the people who often came expecting quick, easy answers to difficult things that they needed to spend some time with in their lives. It was always sad when I experienced people like that. It was really hard for them to know that they didn't have it all figured out, that it was okay to have the questions, to be confused. But this was part of the journey of maturity. And what's true for the psychological, emotional life is also true for our spiritual life. And so it occurred to me, maybe what's going on in this scripture is that now is Jesus putting the light of truth on, on Nicodemus, he's putting the light of grace. And that light of grace is the grace not to give Nicodemus what he wants, but to grant to Nicodemus what he really needs. Maybe Jesus knew that Nicodemus, for once in his life, didn't ha needed to feel that like he didn't have to have it all together, that he could be confused, and that confusion would lead him to something deeper. Maybe Jesus spoke away to Nicodemus, knowing that he could not understand until he was willing to let go of many of his assumptions and dogmatic ways of thinking about things. Maybe Nicodemus needed to take the risk of having to let go of some things. He was a man who had much, who valued his status, no doubt. Maybe he was needing to risk that status and his position of power. Jesus seems to have a habit of doing this to people. He often gives us the opposite of what we want. We want him to give us something simple, and he gives us something hard. That's what he did with the rich young ruler, remember? The young man who came to him wanting to find the way of eternal life. And Jesus said, go and sell all that you have. Well, that's a tough, that's a tough one, Jesus. You may like to know that he does this with us. I think about the times it's happened in my life when I'm nurturing maybe a grudge or a resentment and I'm holding on to it, wanting to not let someone off the hook with that. But Jesus says, forgive. I think about the times in my life where I want peace and comfort. When I want to go to church, I want to hear a message from a friend who's preaching and I want it to comfort me and that message is not one of peace and comfort. It is a message that tells me and reminds me of my obligations as a Christian, a person of faith, to care for the weakest in the world. And I start to feel like I'm not doing enough and I'm not comforted, but I'm challenged. Maybe it's liking to figure out all those times that we all have. We want to figure God out. We want to have this whole theology thing done, this whole understanding who God is, and we want to put God in this nice box. We want someone to hand us the four spiritual laws so we can find that path that takes us to heaven, and we can say, I've got Christianity taken care of. I can check that box off. When God wants something much deeper, God wants us to be transformed, not just added to, but changed. Not a new insight, not a new theology, but a radical reorientation of our lives. And that's why the image that Jesus chooses in this scripture is so wonderful. There's no other way to talk about it. He says, you must be born again. There's another word of Jesus that gets translated two different ways. Born again, as in the way Nicodemus takes it? You mean i got to be born again and get back in my mom's womb? How is that going to happen, Jesus? I don't know what you're talking about. But Jesus knows the other meaning of the word, born from above. In other words, born again through God. Rebirthed in the womb of God. And that's a powerful thought. To be rebirthed in the very womb of God. That's what Jesus says, in fact. You know, I think it's a wonderful image to play with. You think about when you have a, a baby is in a womb. What, where is a baby? A baby is in a womb. A baby is mostly in darkness, right? And it's in that place of darkness, preparation, that is being ready to be born. And in that place, everything is provided. A baby in a womb does not need to have what? Theology, knowledge, words, doesn't have any of that. 
Just sensations, feelings, feelings of hunger, feelings of satisfaction, feelings of comfort. And then that baby goes through that process of being born. Born into the light of the world, out of the darkness. And it can be a scary place, but then that child and that fear discovers that there's a mother or father that's going to take care of him or her. That it's going to understand what the needs are, what is required in the moment, and empathetically be attuned to that child and provide that. And the more that happens time and time and time again, that child gets to learn, I'm okay. This world is okay. And I'm going to know that no matter how bad things get, I have that basic sense of well-being. There is an abundance that has always been there for me. And because I have that, I can dare be abundant and trusting and giving to others. In other words, Jesus asks us to go back to the fundamentals. He wants Nicodemus to say, you know, religion is a very good thing, but you've missed a step here. You've missed the step that's so very basic, that basic sense of love and trust that comes when we're born of God's womb and we're loved. I think it very interesting that so many of us have trouble thinking about God as female. But when we read this verse, we should have trouble thinking about God as male. Years ago, a pastor uh, was baptizing an infant. Well, it wasn't going well. I've been there. And you've been there. As a congregation, you've been there. I've been there many times. I've been there, and I can, I can remember that happening. And I, so I could relate. I mean, this child was just screaming. It was ear-piercing screaming. The whole congregation was like, will you just get this over with? So he was going through the ritual as devoutly as he could, but as quickly as he could. Came time to hold the baby. Oh, boy. He held that baby. That baby screamed more than it ever screamed before. He held that baby in love. But as quick as he could, he reached into that water and he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And then he added, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I doubt that pastor knew what he was saying. Whether you like it or not. But well, what a profound theological statement that is. It doesn't matter whether we like it, whether we want it. Love and grace is something God just has for us. And it's not something we can lose. It's a free gift given by a loving God. And we don't have to have our thinking right, our theology right, or be right. We have to do one thing, and that's say, yes, God, and receive it. And let it transform us. And if we've missed that step, and we go ahead and try to get all the theology and the morality, how I'm supposed to act, and we don't know it's grace that saves us, we find it very hard not to live in a world afraid. Because we think we've got to prove ourselves. We think, I've got to be good enough. I've got to get that right. And if I don't get that right, I'm lost. And we fear God. And we fear the world around us because, well, we know we don't have it all right. But when we are reborn in God, then we got it right. And Nicodemus, for all the smarts, you got to go back to plan A, the basics, and know that you're just loved. There was a mother, she was trying to put her daughter Lisa in bed one night, five-year-old. The daughter did not want to go to bed. In fact, the daughter was in the middle of doing some stuff, and Mom said, no, you got to go to bed, and the daughter screamed and got very angry. And she took her up into the bedroom, was putting her in bed, and I said, I hate you. I hate you. She says, Lisa, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I love you. She says, no, don't love me. You can't love me. No. And the mother said, Lisa, it's not up to you. No matter what you say or do, I love you. 
And that is God. That is God. We hear from Nicodemus only two more times. The first we hear is an attempt he has to defend Jesus to some of the leaders of the nation who want Jesus dead. And then the last time we, he, we see him, we see him with another man we've heard about, Joseph of Arimathea, both leaders in the nation are carrying the body of Jesus and they're wrapping him lovingly and laying him in a tomb. And we're told something that we didn't know. Riskly and bravely, Nicodemus has come forward with 75 pounds of burial spices. Very, very expensive. And here's the catch. It only takes two pounds. So what was the 75 pounds of spice? It was 75 pounds of gratitude and love. Amen.